Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today, I can finally show you how the new 8-core 9th gen processors perform. There's a lot to go over in this video, so I won't waste too much time going over the specs and all that. Plus, they've been up for pre-order now for about 10 days, so none of that stuff really is a mystery at this point. On hand for testing, I have the Core i9-9900K. I actually ended up with a few of those processors, so I will be able to hand one of them off to Tim, and then he can do some additional testing, perhaps look at things like streaming performance, because I know there's a few of you guys that are interested in those kind of benchmarks. Uh, then we also have the 9700K, which is basically the same CPU, but crucially with hyper-threading disabled. So the Core i9-9900K is an eight core processor with hyper-threading enabled for 16 threads that operates at a base frequency of 3.6 gigahertz, but will boost as high as 4.7 gigahertz on all cores with a maximum single core frequency of five gigahertz. The L3 cache has been increased from the 8700K's 12 megabyte capacity up to 16 megabytes. And quite shockingly, despite packing two extra cores and four megabytes more cache, the TDP rating remains at 95 watts, which was already suspiciously low for the 8700K. And we will explore the impact of this a little bit later on in the video. As I said, the 9700K is also an eight core processor, but it lacks hyper-threading support, meaning it packs just eight threads. It comes close clocked at the same 3.6 GHz base frequency, while the all-core and single-core clock speeds have been devalued by 100 MHz, and the L3 cache capacity dropped down to 12 MB. For testing, I'm using the MSI Z390 Godlike, but I've also confirmed the results with ASRock's Z390 Tai Chi Ultimate. Both boards were tested using DDR4-3200CL14 memory, and this same memory was used on all platforms without any manually tuned timings. The graphics card of choice is Gigabyte's RTX 2080 Ti Gaming OC, and we have loads of results to go over, so let's get started. First up, we have the memory bandwidth results, and unsurprisingly, the new Coffee Lake refresh CPUs are on par with previous models such as the Core i7 8700K. So everything is as expected here. Let's check out some Cinebench results. As expected, the 9900K and 9700K provide the highest out-of-the-box single-thread scores uh, that we've seen to date, easily breaking the 200-point barrier thanks to the 5 GHz and 4.9 GHz clock speeds when using just a single core. With all cores active, the 9900K breaks the 2000 point barrier, making it 14% faster than the Ryzen 7 2700X. Meanwhile, the 9700K managed a score of just over 1500 points, and that placed it just behind the old 1800X and just ahead of the 8700K. That also meant it was 26% slower than the 9900K. Given what we saw in Cinebench, it's no surprise that the 900K outclassed the 2700X in Blender, reducing the workload completion time by a rather large 23%. That said, the 8-core Ryzen CPU was a fraction faster than the 9700K. Moving on to Corona, and here we find a similar story. The 9900K reduced the render time by 20% from the 2700X, taking just 96 seconds. That said though, I should just point out, if you're mostly rendering, then something like the Threadripper 2950X makes more sense. And I will talk about this a bit more later on in the video. The last rendering application that we tested with is V-Ray, and here the 9900K reduced the render time by 18%, taking just 62 seconds opposed to 76 seconds for the 2700X. The 9700K was a lot less impressive, taking a few seconds longer than the 8700K, making it slower than both the 1800X and 2700X. The PC Mark 10 Synthetic Gaming Benchmark relies heavily on both the core clock speed and the core count. That said, it's interesting to see the 9900K only matching the 2700X here, while the 9700K was only just able to edge ahead of the older 1800X. When it comes to file compression performance, the 9900K is roughly on par with the 7820X, while the 9700K fell just short of the 8700K, which meant it was also slower than the 2700X. Decompression performance is significantly stronger on the AMD CPUs, and here even the Ryzen 7 1800X is able to edge ahead of the 9900K. The 9700K was able to slot back in ahead of the 8700K, making it just a fraction faster than the 2600X. Moving on to our Excel testing, and here we see a rapid completion time of just 1.8 seconds for the 9900K, reducing the completion time by 32% when compared to the 9700K, and 19% compared to the 2700X. So a solid result for the 9900K. The 9700K though was much less impressive, only slotting in between the 8700K and Ryzen 5 2600X. The Core i7 8700K already had the Ryzen 7 2700X beat in handbrake, so the new 8-core models take that a step further. Even the 9700K was seen to be faster than the 8700K here. When compared to the 2700X, the 9900K was 32% faster, though it was 20% slower than the 2950X. 
For those of you like me who use Premiere Pro CC a lot, or any other video software on a daily basis, these numbers will be of great interest. Here the encoding performance of the 9900K is roughly on par with the 7820X, meaning it was 8% faster than the 2700X, and 17% faster than the 9700K. That said, it was almost 20% slower than the 2950X, so if time really is money, that's still a better option. Editing performance with our warp stabilizer test sees the 1900K only just edge ahead of the 8700K and 9700K. This meant while it was a bit faster than the Ryzen 7 2700X, it was quite a bit slower than the 2950X. Okay, so time to check out total system consumption. As expected, the new 8-core models are serious power pigs. The 9700K matched the 7820X with a total system draw of 235 watts when running our handbrake workload. The 9900K pushed total system consumption 9% higher, hitting 255 watts, which is 13% more power than the 16-core Threadripper 2950X system consumed. We find a similar story when testing with Blender, though the AMD CPUs did perform better in this application. As a result, the 2950X was able to work a bit harder, but even so, it still consumed less power than the 9900K. That's enough power consumption data for the moment. Let's check out some overclocking performance. Right, so overclocking these 8 core parts to 5.1 GHz wasn't easy. It required 1.375 volts and a massive liquid cooler. You aren't hitting this frequency with a 240mm closed loop cooler. Uh, 5 GHz is probably off the table as well, and we will look at thermal performance in a moment. Looking at the Cinebench R15 multi-threader results, the 9900K saw an 8% performance boost, while the 9700K saw a 7% boost. I should also note that I have two 9900K samples and both struggled with the 5.1 GHz overclock. They could boot into Windows at 5.2 GHz and run a few basic tests, but anything more would result in the blue screen of death, even at 1.45 volts. Moving on to Corona, the 9900K was 7% faster once overclocked, while the 9700K enjoyed a 9% performance bump. Finally, we have the Premiere results, and again, the 9700K saw a 9% performance boost, and the 9900K an 8% boost. So only single digit gains, making it hard to justify the increase in power consumption and operating temperatures. Speaking of power, the 9700K configuration consumed 15% more power once overclocked, and the 9900K system an additional 19%, taking the total system consumption to 294 watts. Now, when it came to operating temperatures, I have nothing but bad news. These eight core CPUs might have a stim pack, I mean, soldered thermal interface, but you wouldn't necessarily know it. Stock out of the box with either a premium air cooler or a decent closed loop liquid cooler, you're looking at load temperatures well into the 80s, and overclocking is basically out of the question. Sure, 5 GHz might be okay for games, but if you're placing all 8 cores under prolonged stress, temperatures will hit 100 degrees. And I was testing in a relatively cool room inside a well-ventilated case. Using a custom liquid cooling setup only reduced the stock operating temperature by 8 degrees, and we're talking about a $400 to $500 US kit here. It was possible to run up to 5.1 GHz, but even then, temperatures were still knocking on the door of 100 degrees, which is obviously quite insane. So the 9900K might be fast, but good luck keeping it at a reasonable temperature. I ran out of time to test the thermal performance of the 9700K, but I will include that data in a future content piece. For now, let's move on to games. Again, due to time and how much we already had to cover in this single video, we're only going to show the gaming performance of half a dozen titles, starting with Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Here we see the 9900K boosting frame time performance by just 4% at 1080p when compared to the 8700K, while the 9700K was slightly better providing a 7% increase. Sometimes we see CPUs performing better with SMT disabled if they have more than enough cores. The Ryzen processors certainly get mugged at 1080p while looking at the average frame rate. Here the 9900K was 23% faster, though it was just 10% faster for the 1% low result. Again, we are using an RTX 2080 Ti, and we see when moving to the more appropriate or realistic 1440p resolution that the margins start to really shrink. Here we see that the new 8-core models offer basically no performance advantage over the 8700K. That said, the performance advantage over Ryzen was still reasonably significant, and it's not until we hit the 4K resolution that the margin is almost entirely eliminated. Still, this isn't a good title for Ryzen, so let's move on to Star Wars Battlefront 2. 
Here we see much more respectable performance from the Ryzen processors, and even at 1080p, the Intel Core i7 and i9 processors don't offer a noticeable performance gains over the 2700X. The 9900K was just 5% faster than the 8700K, while the 9700K was 7% faster. Then at 1440p, we see no real difference between the Intel processors, and now Ryzen is less than 10% slower. Finally, at the 4K resolution, we see the playing field neutralized, and now all five tested the CPUs enable the same 76 FPS on average. Next up, we have Forza Horizon 4, which isn't a particularly CPU demanding title, so unsurprisingly, all CPUs enabled a similar level of performance. This is a good example of how most games will behave, as most games are indeed GPU bound. Like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Hitman is a title that plays a little oddly with Ryzen, and this gave the Intel CPUs a serious performance advantage, particularly at 1080p and 1440p. The 9900K was also up to 12% faster than the 8700K, which can be seen when comparing the 1% low results at 1080p. Rainbow Six Siege shows little to no performance gains for the 8-core 9th gen processors over the 8700K, even at 1080p. Meanwhile, the Intel processors did offer a performance boost over the Ryzen 7 2700X, even at 1440p, though the gains aren't exactly noticeable. The last game we're going to look at is Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and here the 2700X gets trounced at 1080p, limiting the RTX 2080 Ti to around 90 FPS on average, while the Intel CPUs pushed on hit around 120 FPS. That said, for the most part, the 9900K and 9700K offered no real performance advantage over the 8700K. The 9900K did allow for a 10% boost to the 1% low result at 1080p, but other than that, not much to report here. I also took a bit of time to test gaming performance with the 900K and 9700K overclocked to 5.1 gigahertz. Interestingly, we see no performance gain when testing with Assassin's Creed Odyssey, even at 1080p. We found in the past that overclocking the 8700K led to almost no performance gains, or at least very small performance gains at 1080p, with the 1080 Ti, and the same appears true with the RTX 2080 Ti. Again, we see this time when testing with Star Wars Battlefront 2 that there's really no performance advantage to overclocking these CPUs. A mere 3% performance boost is seen with the 9900K, and even less for the 9700K. That said, Hitman is a title that did see double-digit performance gains from the overclock. Here, the 9th Gen 8 core processors were up to 12% faster at 1080p and 1440p once overclocked. Okay, so I've got two final graphs that I'd like to discuss which compare the performance of Intel's new 9900K on a flagship Z390 motherboard to that of a budget Z370 motherboard. MSI's Z370 PC Pro packing a real four-phase VRM. And for reference, I've included the Core i7 8700K and Threadripper 2950X results. So, starting with the stock out-of-the-box performance, we saw that the MSI Z390 Godlike allowed the 900K to produce a score of 2,048 points. Now, slotting that CPU onto the Z370 PC Pro resulted in a score of just 1,790 points after a six-run average. Initially, the score started up around 1,900 points, but on the second pass, we saw a lot more VRM throttling, and this continued as we ran the test four more times to report an average of six runs. This meant, on average, the 900K was 13% slower on the budget Z370 board. It is possible to enter the BIOS and remove the power limits, and this did see full performance restored. But even then, we still saw some VRM throttling going on, and I did have a 120mm fan directly over the V-Core VRM heatsink. So this is likely shortening the life of the motherboard, and I don't recommend removing limits on boards with them in place. Interestingly, if you overclock the 900K on the Z370 board with the limits in place, the performance is much worse than if we did nothing at all. Basically, the increased V-Core voltage sees the VRM throttle even harder with the limits in place, and this further reduces the CPU core clock speeds. Again, removing the power limits does mostly restore performance to what was seen on the Z390 board, but if you're placing this board under heavy load for extended periods of time on a regular basis, I don't imagine it will have a long and happy life. Likely expect fireworks in the short term. Wrapping things up, let's take a quick look at a few application price versus performance charts. For this, I'm using the current market price, with the exception of the Core i7-7820X. Here I'm just using the MSRP, as the current market price is inflated by about $300. It's not worth buying one at the MSRP as it is, so let's just go with that as a best case scenario. Quite clearly, if you want to get some rendering work done on a serious budget, there's no beating the Ryzen 5 2600 right now. It's really not that much slower than the Core i7 7800X, and it's a heck of a lot cheaper. But let's focus on the new CPUs, the 9900K and 9700K. The 9700K is better than the 8700K in terms of value, 
but still much worse than the cheaper Ryzen 7 2700X. Meanwhile, the 9900K smokes the 2700X in terms of performance, but at almost twice the price, it's poor value in comparison. If time really is money, then the much more expensive 2950X seems like the obvious choice here. Also, please note these price versus performance charts don't factor in motherboard and cooling costs. I will discuss those shortly. The Intel CPUs stack up much better on Handbrake and do offer more bang for your buck when compared to the competing AMD CPUs. That said, this really is a worst case scenario for Ryzen, at least in our battery of benchmarks. As we saw previously, the Ryzen 7 2700X really is the ultimate value option for budding content creators, and the new 8-core Intel CPU simply can't hold a candle to it in terms of value. The 9900K doesn't offer anything new here when compared to the 7820X, while the 9700K was no better than the 8700K. So a disappointing set of results here for Intel in Adobe Premiere. Right, so we've just seen a boatload of graphs. It's now time to try and make sense of it all. These new 8-core Coffee Lake processors certainly are interesting animals, and I'm not entirely sure who they're for. But before I try and work that, I probably should just touch on pricing quickly since I haven't actually mentioned that in this video yet. So the Core i9 900K, that comes at an MSRP of $500 US, but as we've just seen, it currently costs more like $580 US. And then we have the 9700K, and that's meant to sell for, well, in thousand lot quantities, $374 US. It should be around that price, and we're currently seeing it a fair bit over that at $420 US. Of course, the Core i7 8700K is also a little over the MSRP right now, priced at $390 US rather than the $360 US that it was selling for a few months ago before the supply shortages and all that stuff kicked in. Anyway, we've now established that the new eight core parts aren't cheap, but who are they designed for exactly? Well, I know a lot of you guys are gamers and Intel has been touting the 9900K as the world's best gaming CPU, which I suppose technically it is, but at 1080p with an RTX 2080 Ti, it's barely any better than the 8700K. Uh, previously the world's best gaming CPU and arguably still the best in terms of value though uh, we're talking about extreme high refresh rate gaming value there. At $150 US, the Ryzen 5 2600 is now without question the best value gaming CPU overall. That's just a ridiculously good buy at that price. In my opinion, the minor performance gains the 9700K and 9900K offer in some games using unrealistic settings doesn't make them better gaming CPUs than the 8700K, at least right now. The added power consumption and heat makes them less attractive options in my opinion. They really are getting too hot to handle. For almost a 50% increase in price, you're looking at maybe a 5% increase in performance, assuming you don't game at 4K. So while certainly very fast gaming CPUs, I feel like neither the 9700K or 9900K make that much sense for those looking to game exclusively. They might be useful as streaming processors. We haven't actually looked at that yet, as not enough of you actually care about streaming benchmarks for that to be part of our day one coverage, but Tim will follow up with that testing soon. Then if we look at application performance, it's still hard to justify buying either of these eight core processors. For the most part, the 9700K is slower than the 2700X, while the 900K is up to 30% faster. So that is pretty impressive, at least when overlooking the fact that it costs 90% more, not factoring in the cost of the additional cooling, another subject that's a real issue for this CPU. There's simply no way you're going to avoid thermal throttling without spending around $100 US on the cooler, at least without your PC sounding like a jet about to take off. Throw in the Corsair H100i Pro and the 9900K now costs $700 US and you still can't really overclock it, at least without running at dangerously high temperatures. Later this month, the Threadripper 2920X will be landing for $650 US, and that means you can land at this upcoming 12-core processor with cooler for the same price as the 900K with a cooler. And I'll leave it up to you guys to work out which one's probably going to be faster for productivity workloads. Granted, X399 motherboards do cost about $100 more, but you get twice as many DIMM slots, way more PCIe lanes, and, well, a serious workstation platform. Therefore, Purely for productivity, the 900K really makes no sense in our opinion. In fact, the only scenario where it might make sense is for someone who's after an extreme high refresh rate gaming system that also does a lot of core heavy productivity work. So I guess it's basically the perfect CPU for a YouTube gamer. For someone who doesn't want to run two different systems like I do, the 900K 
might make sense. For work, I have a Threadripper 2950X workstation, and for play, I have a Core i7 8700K gaming rig. It allows me to enjoy the best of both worlds. The 9900K is every bit as good as the 8700K for gaming, but not nearly as good as the 2950X for most core heavy productivity workloads. So you can't exactly say it's the best of both worlds, but if you lean more heavily uh, to the gaming side of things, then I guess it is a better choice. Obviously, no matter your preference, only those with money to burn will consider buying a 900K at its current market price, or even the $500 US MSRP for that matter. For me, it's just too expensive and too impractical. Keeping it cool seems like a daily challenge, and unless you're going all out on custom cooling, it's a challenge you'll likely fail. Basically, you can build a Ryzen 7 2700X gaming rig with a GTX 1080 Ti and still save over $100 on the 900K build using a GTX 1070. So like I said, unless you have money to burn, the 900K makes a little to no sense at the current asking price. The Core i7 9700K, well, that's an even worse proposition in my opinion. Although I haven't done all the thermal testing that I would like to just yet, uh, what I noticed when testing sort of my initial impressions of it is that it does appear to run a bit hotter than the 8700K, which is quite shocking because it is a soldered chip. So yeah, not sure what's going on there, but I will be probably looking into that as you're watching this video. So there'll be some follow-up content uh, looking into thermal performance a bit more closely. It also consumes a bit more power than the 8700K and for the most part really only offered a minor performance bump. So I'd like in this comparison to what we saw earlier in the week with the RTX 2070 and GTX 1080, uh, in the sense that the newer product is mostly faster by a very small margin, but it also costs a little bit more. And as I said, unfortunately, whereas the RTX 2070 used less power than the GTX 1080, we're not seeing that with the 9700K. It isn't more fuel efficient than the 8700K. At this point, I don't have too much more to add, or at least too much more that I feel like I could add in this video. It's probably been quite long as it is, and we will have a week or two's worth of follow-up content, no doubt. And there's plenty more testing and things to look at. And no doubt you guys will have some ideas of things that you would like us to look into. So... Yeah, I will be doing that over the next few weeks. But yeah, it's been a busy week this week. We had the GeForce RTX 2070 launch just a few days ago, and that was a really rushed review. Uh, yeah, so still recovering from that one. But anyway, interesting look at the new Core i9-900K and Core i7-9700K. Very, very keen to hear your thoughts uh, on these new processes in the comment section below. So as always, I will be reading those and responding to a good amount of them. Anyway, that is gonna do it for this one. If you did enjoy the video, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe for more content, and if you appreciate the work with your horror box, then consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.